With everything we know about anole evolution, a lot of people want to know, are anoles still evolving today? And they mean in nature, outside of these experiments we've done on small islands. Everything we know suggests that anoles should still be evolving. One way to find examples of modern day evolution is to look for places where anoles are facing new challenges in their environment today. An invasive species is a species that um, is causing negative uh, economic or ecological impacts um, for the native species that it encounters. And so two features of invasions are often their high population density and their rapid range expansion in a non-native area. One of the reasons uh, for studying biological invasions is because it gives us insights into what happens when a species encounters a novel environment. At this site here in South Miami, this is sort of a hub of the Anolis invasions. Commonly, we uh, encounter about six different species of anoles. Um, one of them is the native green anole, Anolis carolinensis, um, that's distributed throughout the southeastern U.S. And then there are five non-native species. Some have come through the pet trade, they also stow away on cargo ships. The Puerto Rican crested anole was introduced to Miami um, in the 1970s. Miami isn't the only place where the crested anole is thriving in a city. On its home island of Puerto Rico, it's also abundant in urban areas. What is it about the crested anole that makes it do so well in cities? Researchers are trying to find out they've begun to study how the crested anole is adapted to life in the city. Urbanization is the transformation of natural habitats into man-made habitats, things like cities. As cities grow, animals that live in natural environments begin to encounter these urban environments more often. The overarching question my research is trying to tackle is can humans influence the course of evolution? In order to understand the evolutionary effects of urbanization, I've been comparing populations in paired urban and natural sites. I think a lot of people do get confused when I'm walking around in urban areas. Uh, I am walking around with a fishing pole, which is very strange. Uh, I'm sticking my fishing pole up trees and on their walls, which is even stranger. And so we, we get a lot of questions from people. A key question is how fast can these animals change? And can they keep pace with human mediated changes in the environment? In the natural forest, most anoles live on the trunks of trees, branches of trees, higher up in the canopy, sometimes on the ground. So how steady and stable are they running on these new smooth surfaces that they don't often encounter in natural forests? Buildings and walls, lamp posts those specialized scales that are on their toes that allow them to grip to walls or to trees. I found that the urban lizards have more of those scales, they're called lamellae, and they also have larger toe pads. And so we think that this might have to do with the smoother surfaces that they are clinging to in urban areas. We've also found that they have longer limbs in urban areas, but we don't know why these trait differences exist. We need to connect how the traits influence the actual performance in the real world. Based on the differences between the forest populations and the urban populations, we expect that the urban animals will run faster on smooth vertical substrates. So we're specifically running them on painted concrete, on bark, and on unpainted metal. And so these are surfaces that an urban lizard would encounter in its daily life, but a forest lizard would have only ever encountered the bark. The lizards running on the painted concrete and on the metal ran slower and they tended to slip a lot more. 
but so far across all the tracks we found that the urban lizards ran faster than the forest lizards. In urban areas it's also much hotter. We found that on average the urban populations had about a six degree warmer temperature at the perch site compared to the forest populations and this difference was also reflected in their body temperature. We set up our own little field station here in the, in the forest and uh, once we catch lizards in these natural areas and in cities, uh, we bring them back here and we test for the limits of their ability to function both at high temperatures and low temperatures. So in order to figure out the hottest temperatures where a lizard can function, we uh, heat them up and then we flip them onto their back and uh, we look for the temperature that they're no longer able to flip themselves back over because a lizard always wants to be on its feet. It always wants to be right side up. What we found is across all of the locations that we sampled, the urban lizards were able to tolerate temperatures of around one degree higher on average compared to the forest lizards. One degree Celsius might not seem like a lot, but for a lizard, this is a difference of being able to be active all day long and have access to all of those mates and all of that food that you otherwise would have to give up because you're hiding in the shade trying to cool down. We have decades of research on anoles showing how their ecology and their morphology and their performance and survival, how all of these things are related. And to have those hypotheses confirmed in these urban habitats is really exciting because it means the same rules that apply in forests apply in these novel habitats. One of the remarkable things about these changes that are occurring is that some species are able to adapt very rapidly within a matter of just a few generations to these new conditions that they're experiencing. This does give me some hope that these species will be able to handle whatever we throw at them you know, as we begin to change the environment or as we continue to change the environment. In the long term, the future for anoles is very rosy. They adapt very rapidly. I'm sure that a million years from now, we'll have plenty of anole species living wherever it is we live. The study of anoles has really taken off in the last 10 years or so. It seems that people from a variety of different fields have come to realize that anoles are great for answering all kinds of questions. So the anole community has never been larger, and the types of questions people ask has never been broader. And so I think anoles will continue to make important contributions to our general knowledge of biology for years to come. <laughs>